Good morning, I'm uh, Jay Duhon. I'm a cattle grazer in Calcasieu Parish. About the middle of October here today. And right now we're trying to get ready for our winter coverage, which will include ryegrass, forage turnips, and uh, deep-seeded radish. Normally we use no-till drilling. That is too wet and we're gonna have to no-till, but we're gonna use fire and cultipacking to plant our winter cover. Hi, I'm Anna Dugan Stokes, and me and my dad, Jay, raise cattle here in Gum Cove, Louisiana. We're on the Intercoastal Canal, that's our south fence line. We, we're at the mercy of the tide all the time. We're at the mercy of a storm in the Gulf, or a low pressure system, or just a lot of rain. We're not unique in facing the challenges of a lot of rain and tidal effects. Everybody forming art in the cattle business, it's a challenge. And we're going to have to adjust some of our strategies because of that. We're burning in preparation for a no-till winter coverage. We are going to burn, then plant, the, spread the seed, and then cultivate. Hi, I'm Chris Abel. I work for NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. By doing this, we're going to get that seed down to the soil and have that layer of old dead grass off the top of that so that when that seed germinates, it's got plenty of sunlight and it can go ahead and get some good seed to soil contact. And then we're gonna have a much better germination. Oh, well, fire has been used in the coastal prairie and marsh for a hundred years. Because of the massive forming that took place, burning wasn't used very much. It's, it's a way to manage and, and to control these brush species and to also increase the quality of the forages. So it, it's a very cost effective way to do that. The other option is herbicides and sometimes herbicides are necessary in the beginning to get control of those brush species when they're really big. If you can use prescribed burning as a maintenance tool, then you don't have that big cost with those herbicides. Burning is coming back. Burning has been coming back for the last five or six years in our area. They don't necessarily burn every pasture every year, but what they try to do is try to get a burn on those pastures, each pasture maybe every other year or at least every third year. And by doing that, again, you can really have a good effect on those woody plants that are trying to invade and croach on some of these pastures, which there are a lot of very aggressive woodies, brush species that everyone in this whole area has trouble with trying to come in these grasslands and basically take over these grasslands. It's a more environmentally sustainable way other than disking the ground, stirring the ground up. But if you use proper grazing and fire, those are the two cheapest ways to improve your pasture. kind of grazing, they talk, they, a lot of people talk about it and say it's rotational grazing. I simply call it graze it and rest it. We have a thousand acres here and we have them broke up into 13 pastures. Those 13 pastures are broke into smaller pastures with electric fencing. We can move to 14 different pastures on this place. In early spring, when the grass is just coming, Everything kind of goes wherever until it catches up to them and then we start their rotational system. You at least want to rest the pasture that you moved out of the first one at least 20 days. We, we're able to do better than 20 days. We're in South Louisiana and, and our weather does produce a lot of forage. In the winter time, they stay on a rotational system and we also stockpile pasture for them for early fall and into the winter. By doing this, we are able to run more cows per acre and it's made our grass better. We, we don't own a tractor and we don't own a bush hog. 
the cows are in the bush hog. The more cows we put, our input is less, but our output is more, uh, as long as Mother Nature uh, works with us. So to the south of this area that we're burning today is what we call our stockpile pasture. It's a pasture that we have not grazed through the summer. Seven years ago, I read an article on stockpiling pasture. Mr. J has been operating his cattle operation much like most of the uh, traditional uh, operators in this area where they would graze the, the growing warm season forages all through the growing season and then during the winter they would feed hay all winter. Jay got tired of that. He said, Chris, there's got to be a better way. And he said, yeah, stockpiling is, is a good way to do, good thing to do. So we picked a, a pasture and did, did stockpiling on it. This is all joint grass. We start moving the cattle to stockpile pasture around November the 1st. So in November, in December on the stockpile pasture and the supplements of proteins and minerals. These cattle will will rotate them in and out of it as we see fit, uh, depending on how the weather is. We don't feed hay on our place. We stockpile pasture. We let the cows bail the hay. Our cost per cow, we're running about $260 a head Somebody from Nebraska or North Dakota or South Dakota would not buy that in a New York minute. Down here, a lot of vegetation that would grow. We can get by less than $300 cost per cow. At Duhon Cattle, we raise commercial Brangus and Brayford cows, and we run registered Angus bulls. We'll pick a few heifers each year to retain that are out of these high car carcass bulls so that our genetics continue to get better. We are in the Performance Beef Alliance where fellow cattlemen that are near us, we all run the same type mama cow. We all use registered Angus bulls. And the reason in doing this is we're able to take the calves and pull them all together. And instead of having one load of calves, we have three 18-wheeler loads of calves. They have the same vaccines, they're wormed, and we weigh them at the spring working. Everybody turns the information into me, sex, color, weight. Then I take all the calves, put them on a spreadsheet, and I sort them to make 48,000 pound loads. And then I start marketing them. The, the ultimate prize is you want a calf that weans heavy, and you want the most money per pound for that calf. Every year is different. It's not the same thing every day, and it's not the same thing every year. I became a member of GLCI, and when I became a member of, and started going to the meetings, started going to the field days, the pasture walk, I really learned that raising and resting pasture was clearly a, a much better way to improve your pasture. There's no question that using these grazing practices that we're going to we talk about in the GLCI clearly more efficient. The real issue is in the future you're not going to be able to do it without using it. The, the amount of property available for this kind of these kinds of operations is going to be tougher and tougher to come by. The cattle rancher and the farmer is going to have to be more efficient in using these practices to make them more efficient. As the weather and as as things, as the cycles, the fall, the spring, the summer, all that changes. It's not a same thing every year. You'll have a pasture set aside and you're, you're thinking, I'm, I'm going to move them to this on this day and then it rains five inches. That's, that's all part of being in the cattle business. It's all part of being a grass farmer, which is what we really are, and it's all part of dealing with Mother Nature. The average herd of cattle in the United States is 40, 40 cattle. A lot of people have the impression that everybody has a big ranch that has cattle. 
So if a person, a young man or a young woman, wanted to raise cattle and they didn't have but 80 acres or 60 acres, or even 40 acres, using the techniques, the grazing, the resting part of your pasture, and giving the part that you've grazed before time to rest, I think you could raise enough cattle for it to be uh, worthwhile.